so before I get too ahead of myself, I guess I should start uh, showing off what I'm working on. So, right here is the circuit that we got planned out for our Arduino powered fan controller. So I have two fans and one fan is a two speed. So we have our factory fan over here and then we have our two speed Volvo fan. So up here we have our relays. So we have our coil side and the side that gets switched on, all that goes to 12 volts. We have diodes over here for the uh, to take care of the inductant load from the uh, the coils when they turn off or whatever like that. So each one has a diode to uh, take care of all that voltage spike. And the coil gets controlled by a transistor. So the Arduino is going to power the transistor and then transistor is going to turn the relay on. Now the reason why we don't just power the coil by itself is because of how much current it takes. So I measured the coil on one of the relays and it was 73 ohms. So if you do some math you can figure out uh, the amount of power it takes to actually run those coils is too much. The, the Arduinos can only do like maybe 20 milliamps of current and uh, these ones take like 200. <laughs> so yeah, we need the transistor as the middleman to take the uh, extra current. So we have a relay to power a relay to power a fan. <laughs> so yeah, that's the uh, the basic fan controlling part. I still have to drill out the Arduino stuff. So a couple goals that I want here. One, I want to be able to display the temperature. So that that's what this guy's for. It's just a seven segment LCD backpack that I got from Adafruit. It was too big for my regular needs, so I'm gonna repurpose it into something more useful. So along with showing the temperature, uh, I want this to be able to control the fans to whatever I want. I might have a switch or I might have a dial or something like that, but we can move this and change the number to whatever we want. So I guess we could tell it when to turn the fan on and off, which would be pretty cool. So I want each fan to be able to con be controlled uh, separately and turn them on and off in like a sequence. So you can do like low, too low, and then low and high or something like that. Um, but one more thing that I want to put in here that I wasn't able to take care of with my current setup is a uh, AC control. So I want the fans to be able to turn on when the air conditioner comes on because I actually had the uh, receiver dryer blow out on me on the trail, the uh, the purge valve or whatever actually you know, let loose, because the problem is when the fan isn't running, the uh, temperature gets a lot hotter, and with higher temperature, it gets higher pressure. So the high line got so high that it actually blew out of the safety valve. So I guess the fans are kind of important. So one of these inputs is going to be for when the uh, AC compressor kicks on, and that'll turn a fan on as well. So AC control, temperature adjusted control, and display output. Uh, now, the temperature that I'm going to be reading from is the thermostat housing sensor, which is only on 9701 Jeeps, but since I had replaced my thermostat housing, that was the only one I had laying around. So we're going to make use of that sensor too. Um, so on for the, the screen right here, this is just a seven segment. It is I squared C, so we just have our positive and negative for power, and we have our data and our clock, and that's it. And uh, the Adafruit library takes care of the rest. This is the entire code right here. So if we come up here, uh, it uses the wire library, it uses the Adafruit GFX, and the uh, LED backpack. So we tell it up here, it's a seven segment, and uh, then we tell it to begin. And this is all it takes to write. You tell it what you want to print, and then you tell it to actually write, so this sends the final command to write everything. And it just has a 100 millisecond delay, just so that it's not sending stuff constantly. Okay, so real quick, we want to see how many uh, amps it takes to actually run those coils. So, I pulled the connectors out of here, and all we got to do is set our meter onto the amp range, and then touch one terminal here, and then ground the other, and we can see what it takes, but I don't know if I can do this one-handed. But uh, on low, it takes about 150 milliamps. So that's nothing. And then on high, with both of them, it's like 250. There you go. All right, so it's almost 300. But still, that's pretty low. 
So um, it looks like one of the transistors I do have laying around should be able to support that since it has a maximum of 600 milliamp uh, current capacity. So we should be good. So now we can take our wires and uh, figure them all out. All right, so take a look at this big old jumbled mess over here. So we got the uh, Arduino powered off a nine volt battery just for testing. And we got some uh, alligator clips up in the uh, sensor. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> the phone actually picks up the, uh, huh. That's crazy. Well, that sucks. I guess I can't show you the number very well then. <laughs> God damn it. I hate technology. Stupid fucking flickering persistence of vision bullshit. Well, anyway, since you can't read that, that says 263. So that is the raw analog value that we're receiving. So the way that this whole system works... Uh, all we're doing is making a voltage divider. So we're taking this resistance and this resistance and we're reading the middle of it. So what happens is we have two resistors uh, connected to each other and by reading the center we get a division of the two. So we have five volts on one end, ground in the other, and in the middle is a reading that fluctuates because of how this fluctuates, kind of like how a potentiometer works. So by doing that we can get a reading. So we see our raw reading is like 263. But now we just uh, play the guessing game of if we have our resistance curve right, then we figure out the calculation and uh, turn that into an actual reading. So first we have to find ourselves a chart. So if you browse hard enough through the internet, you can find yourself a temperature chart that shows you the, um, the temperature and the resistance range for that sensor. We want the new one over here. So if we come up to this, this blue line right here is our new temperature sender. This is how it works. So as the temperature goes down, the resistance goes up. And it goes up pretty high, pretty fast. So it's got this nice curve going on here. And I think this is the same thing going a different direction. So you can see that as the temperature rises, the resistance lowers. So. Uh, in order for us to be able to use this, we need to make a voltage divider because um, it's hard to read resistance, but it's easy to read voltage. So if we add a second resistor into this sensor, then we get a voltage out instead of a resistance out. So if we take a 5,000 ohm resistor and we add some math, I just have a simple resistor thingy here. Uh, I think it's voltage times R2 divided by R1 plus R2, R1 being the sensor and R2 being the, um, the resistor, or you can switch it around and do it the other way. Uh, this is the voltages that we get. So we can change our resistor value to change these, and we could change our voltage input if we wanted to also change these. But basically what we want is a resistor value that, um, make, that, that keeps us from hitting either ceiling. So we want to stay pretty well in the middle. So if we come down here and we change this resistance value to, let's say, we'll go pretty extreme. We'll change it to like 500. Now, if you see what happened to our, our graph over here, you notice a lot of this is missing now. So we're, we're kind of, we're not making the best use of our entire thing. Sure, we could use it, and it gives us a different curve, one that might be a little easier to work with mathematically, but we're losing resolution. So you want to find a number that uh, keeps you pretty well in there. So let's take this to the other extreme. Let's say, you know, we go with a 50k ohm. Well, now you notice we're hitting a ceiling up here. We're losing a lot of detail up at the top. So you just kind of play with it until you get somewhere in the middle. So for me, I found that 5,000 does pretty well at keeping us right in the middle. It's a little low, but meh, it works. It's a nice, solid number. So now that we know what the voltage is, we can then convert that again into what Arduino sees. So the Arduino uh, has an analog, has a bunch of analog pins on here, right? So all, all along the bottom, we have all those A's. Those are analog pins. Now when you read an analog voltage, it's not a pretty number. It's going to be anywhere from 0 to, uh, 
like 1024. Okay, so it's a, I think it's a 10-bit um, analog digital converter. So what we need to do is take that 1,000 some number and turn it into something useful like a temperature. So we can do a different equation in order to convert our 0 to 5 scale to a 0 to 1024 scale, and it's actually rather easy. So you take your number and you multiply it by the scale that you want and then divide it by the scale that you have. So for instance, we have a 5 volt scale, but we want to go to 1024 as our max. You multiply it by what you want and then divide it by what you have. And then over here, oh no, stop it, fucker. So now when we come over here, this is what the reading would actually be on the Arduino. So if we got, you know, 15, then we would know that it would be negative 40. So that's just a, you know, a, another conversion step. Erp. So now that we got that out of the way, now we can try and figure out how to turn our curvy line over here into a formula. So it depends a whole lot on what kind of curvy line you have because there's many different formulas to make different curves. So the cool thing is you can come in here and once you have this mapped out you go to uh, add trend line. And what this does is Excel will look for a trend line. So if you go into options you can also turn on display equation so you can see what the equation is supposed to be. And then you can go to type. So when you click a different one, it gives you a different curve. So basically you just keep clicking around until you find one that works. Some of them you can't use depending on your scale, like since we go below zero, we have negative values, we can't use power or exponential, and average is pretty much useless. But if you notice, none of these really fit our curve well. So what I've found is that I have to break them up into smaller curves so we have a very long flat area right here that we can just use a regular MX plus B deal. You should probably remember that from geometry, right? <laughs> you go old slope formula. So that one fits pretty well. It's just a regular formula there. For the lower curve, since it's kind of sharp, I had to use a, uh, a log formula. And then for the higher curve, I used um, the polynomial because that just seemed to fit better. So now that we have these split into three different formulas, what I like to do is go into something called Graph Sketch. So, what, what I did was I took the three formulas and I graphed them so that I can see what they actually look like, and then I fine-tune them until I get to what I want. Because if you notice, like for the lower one, the the formula it gave us was kind of crazy. It's like 33.986 log minus 134.39. But I find that, uh, you know, if, if you notice, it doesn't perfectly follow what we want. And it's also just goofy. So I usually try to, um, you know, break it down into smaller whole numbers. Or, you know, at least just simplify it a bit. And mess around until I have a curve that does what I want. So there's two things that we want. We want it to follow our, our plot pretty well, and we also want them to connect somewhere, or at least get really close. If you see a gap between these two, like say you see a gap over here and this is where you want it to connect, you're going to notice there's a big jump between one number and the next when you hit that divide. So you want them to be as close as possible when you switch to the different formula. That way it's a smooth transition. But yeah, basically you just dump it all in here and you just kind of slowly fiddly fart with the numbers until you get a curve that you want. And then you can check it. So in order to check, we will grab a number. So we'll say, let's see how we're doing at 212. So we will type that in. And the cool thing is if you just type in 212, it'll give you a line at 212. So at 212, we should have a reading of, you know, about 900, 901.4. So we come over here, 900, and we follow it up, and hey, look at that. That green lines up perfectly. Cool. So then you basically just pick a couple numbers and see how your curves follow what you need them to follow. 
until you're good. So, now that we have our three different formulas, and you know, sometimes it might be two, it'd be great if you could just get away with one, but sometimes it doesn't work out that great. Now that we have our three, we can go into our Arduino and start to work on that. So now, what we have is an analog read, so we, we just send that to a variable real easy, and then down here is where we start to split it up. So when our thing reads zero, the math is going to cause it to go zero, so I just have it go to like the lowest number I read, so that way it doesn't, you know, jump around. So next, we will do our low curve. So if our analog temperature is less than 200, and this is going off the analog reading, not our real temperature, so if we come into here, our first curve split is going to be at 200, okay? So we, we want to check is if our analog reading is under 200, then follow this curve here. So you go over here, and you say if our variable is less than 200, then do this math here. So this will be 40 times the log of our analog reading. That's what ln means. ln is, you know, log and then subtract 163, great. So if it is not, if this does not prove to be true, then we go to the next else if. So if our analog reading is above 700, which is our next curve over here, so if it is above 700 right here, then follow this one. So we come in here and we say else if this is greater than 700, then do this. So we have power of 2, because it's an exponent, we need an exponent of 2. So you do power of the thing, and then to the, the power you want, so power of 2, blah 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 okay. And then, just as a blanket statement, in case for some reason, you know, there's a, a goofy glitch, you also want to have just a regular else statement, which backs you up in case everything goes wrong. So we're going to use our base straight line as the all else fails else line. So if nothing worked for some reason, it would follow the red line. Yeah, it's not accurate, but it's better than nothing. It's better than the green one or the blue one. So then you go, else, finally, and then you do that. So there you go. All right. So now let's see what the heck that actually looks like. So if we come down to here, and we adjust our potentiometer, which I have just in place, and we mess with this, you notice as we start to go down, we get our negative. Now that reads zero. If I go up just a little bit, it starts to glitch around a little bit. But we can keep playing with it. Now I'm rotating this very slowly. You notice we get a lot of, you know, adjustment. And then once it crosses over the first line, which I think is around 50, now you notice the numbers go a lot slower. It takes a lot longer. Like I have to turn this a lot more to do this. Our next crossover point is 150. So after 150 hits, now the numbers start to climb a lot faster. So I'm still kind of turning at the same speed pretty slowly, but you notice those numbers jump real high, real fast. And we max out at about 290. So, that's not half bad. And how do we check? Well, let's go back. Now we can reverse our math, so one of our plot points was 212, if I can get it there. And I just wrote a little code. I have one of the pins uh, internally pulled up. And if we ground that pin, uh, then it switches to the raw reading. So if we just take these two wires and touch them together, now we get our raw reading. So we get a raw reading of 901. That is our analog raw read. So if we come back over to the Excel chart, do, 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 901 is 212. That is right on the money. That is perfect. So sometimes you might be high or low by, you know, something. But just remember that also the temperature itself, there is a large <laughs> difference, especially as it starts to go higher. But uh, that seems to be more of a problem when you go into the lower temperature range, like zero and negatives. So towards the top, they seem to be a lot closer, which is good. Our accuracy at the uh, higher end is what we really care about anyway. So there you go. So, hopefully your brains aren't too fried. Now that we've got the math out of the way, we can start doing the fun stuff. Our number, blah, blah. 
but let's get on to the flag business. So this is real simple. Basically we have a bunch of uh, flags which are just a, a placeholder. It remembers if something is high or low or true or false or something like that. So basically we use this um, all, all our flags are initially set to false and then what happens is it looks for a temp. So if the temperature goes above 220 and our temp flag is false then we set it true and we will digital write our first pin high. So that's cool. Now the reason why that flag is there is because we need something called hysteresis. So if we were to just leave it at this and do if this and uh, if this is not true then else something else. Um, if you are right at the borderline of 220 and 219 and it was just bouncing around or 220 and 221 uh, and it was bouncing around, it, this would constantly switch on and off and be really obnoxious. So we do something, we add something called hysteresis, which is just a gap, you know. So basically, if it hits 220, turn it on, and then wait. So now, it has to go below 210 to turn off. And the flag is there so that it, it you know if you're on the high side or you're on the low side of it. So... Uh, if that doesn't make any sense, let's just upload that part of the sketch now. And we'll come over to this Johnski and see what happens. So we're reading, we're writing. Okay. So. We're coming along, the engine's getting up to temperature, and all of a sudden, hey, look at that, we're at 220. Okay, our fan comes on. Well, say it was bouncing around like this, bouncing back and forth, 2021, 2021. We don't want our fan to keep shutting on, turning off, shutting on, turning off. So what we do excuse me, is we add a little in between there. So it hit 220 and it turned on. It has to hit 210 to turn off. So that is hysteresis. So that way there's no bouncing around. There's a, a sizable gap there for any issues. And then all I did was copy that and then bump the temperature up. So, you know, 220 is the first fan. I think 225 is the second fan. And then 230 is the final fan. So I'll bring that back down. So there you go, you can kind of see how that works. Alright, so there you go. And then what we can do is play around with the temperature uh, that they flick on and flick off to see what we like. It depends on how quickly our temperature sensor actually reacts to the engine and the fan and blah 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 blah. You get the deal. This is going to be a tuning procedure, so once we get it on the vehicle, then we can play with the specifics. But for now, proof of concept is working great. So now let's get onto the real circuit. Okay, so now we got this hoopla out the Jeep, and uh, we have our proper uh, formula this time. So if we come up into here, of course, this is really still going to act like a dummy, but it says 68. So that sounds about spot on. Yeah, so that's that says 72. Cool. All right, I think we're looking pretty good then. They want like 20 bucks off Rock Auto for the connector. I want to see if I can find one at the junkyard because I could get it for damn near free. So, see what we can find, but I like where this is going. We've got good potential. All right, so this is everything that I want inside my fan controller. So we have four transistors. One is going to be the input for the AC signal. The other three are going to be fan controller outputs. The three for the fans can go up to 600 milliamps, so they should be good for the relay coils. The only thing this is missing is the diodes for the relays to um, stifle the inductor. So let's take a gander here. So we got a potentiometer in place of uh, whatever t our temperature sensor would be. So first we get low, then we get medium, and then we get high. So that's cool, and then when we bring it down, there's a little in-between so they can't just flicker on and off. There's a little hysteresis in there. And the other interesting thing is that fourth one over here, so if we take our AC line, you notice the low fan comes on, and that'll shut on off. I should put a timer on that, so that way, it, you know, it takes like, you know, 20 seconds or something like that after losing a signal for the fan to shut off. So in case the AC flickers a lot, and the cool thing is that doesn't affect the uh, the other bits. So for instance, 
let's see, our AC goes high, and at the same time, our temperature starts to go up. Our other ones still work, and when it drops down, it's still that low will stay on no matter what. So, if you like really badly drawn pictures, this is what's going on. So you can see our resistor and our transistor for each fan. We have each relay, each fan motor, 12 volt power, Arduino power. The only thing that's not shown you is the temperature. So that'll have a 5 volt line going in one, and then that'll come out to the Arduino. And then in the middle of that will be a 5k to ground, so that we can get the signal we need. So yeah, that's pretty much it. The only other thing I could think of is maybe putting an A over here when the AC is active so that you know when that's on and off. But besides that, I think we're ready to go. Okay, so here's the final test. We got ourselves a relay over here. And we got ourselves a 12 volt power supply. So this is the series of business. Spooky! Alright, so uh, I found out I had all my transistors backwards, so that was uh, fun to figure out. So once I switched them all around, now we can properly test them. So now we have the uh, power supply connected to the ground rail and then the positive goes into the coil and then the other side of the coil comes out and goes to the collector of the transistor. But we're just going to apply it safe for now and keep the LED out of that circuit. So, it actually flicks. Cool. And the second test, let's see if our transistor still does it for the AC. Oh yeah! But anyway, cool. Everything seems to function. I may add a uh, tricolor LED to actually indicate what kind of fan is uh, on at the moment. That might be useful. But I think we're we're pretty much there. Prototyping is good, so I think we can put this on the real board now. All right, so with our junkyard connector all hooked up, it seems like we got some stuff here. Anyway, that's a 62. So now, I guess all we have to do, there's two things I need to do. One is figure out what we're gonna use for our AC signal. Uh, and then two is just uh, hooking up all the wires. So one of these relays I can get rid of because it's just an ignition ground switch thinger. So I think it's this one that we can just, you know, get rid of. And one of the wires over here should be for the AC, because it should trigger the, the relay normally. I'll have to go through and see if anything changes with the AC on or off. But yeah, if we can get ourselves an AC signal, all of our wires are run over here. Because these, these wires right here are for the other fan. So we'll just clip them and then run them where we need. Alright, so this should be really easy. I looked back at some of my older videos and found this orange wire over here, and it was giving me issues. Uh, so now that our fan switch is not jumped anymore, uh, if we measure this right now, the AC is on. So if we go from that pin to ground, we actually get 12 volts. If I can hold it straight. So that's awesome. And if we turn the AC off, then we get zero. All right, so that should be a perfect line for us there. Okay, so we got our AC trigger line. So I think now we can uh, finally sit down and figure out how to run all the wires and stuff. Cool. There we go. So now I think I'm finally figuring it all out. So this yellow wire right here is going to be our ignition source. Uh, that comes directly from the fan switch. This is uh, like the closest thing to the, um, the ignition. Hopefully it's not stupid windy. So our yellow is going to be the power that turns the Arduino on. Uh, now the way that I have all these relays wired, they are already wired to 12 volts hot at all times. So here is the ground for the one fan relay right over here. So we ground that. Our fan comes on. And this is exactly what we want. Our transistor is just doing that. It's just, just grounding this, just like that. That's all it's doing. And with the Volvo relay fan over there, I did the same thing. It just runs directly to battery positive. And we have our high and our low. And these are also ground controlled. So, you get your high, 
and you got your low. So they work fine as well. Cool. And the cool thing about the Volvo Relay is the way that it is wired, um, you don't have to turn the low off to use the high. The fan only uses one. You, you can't really, if you're to send power to both relays, bad things would happen, I think. But they're internally wired so that when the high comes on, the low is forced to switch off even if the, the low signal is still active. So that's not a problem. So we have our three ground wires, we have our ignition wire, and this orange one over here is going to be our AC line. So basically everything else can just uh, piss right off, honestly. Sweet! Okay, so now we have our ignition going to the VIN pin. We have our ground back here going to the ground over here. We have our fan, just the low, going to the LED and I unplug the resistor. So that should be just running off the, uh, the finger dinger over there. And then this one over here, we can also use to test the AC. So if we turn the ignition on, then things should either work or blow up. So, take your pick. And... Alright, we're not dead yet. Okay, so that actually comes on. Cool. So now, if we spin this... Right now we're reading about 200. So if we hit 220, hey, 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 spin it down, oh my god, that's cool, that's cool, and since this should just be a 12 volt input, right, that goes to the base, okay, so if we touch this, hey, oh, mommy, Oh yeah, that's sick, cool. So then the only other thing I'd have to do is run that to this guy, and that would flick the AC. Oh my god, it fucking works. Oh, that's so cool. Oh my god. Dude, Arduinos are magic. Look at that shit. Ah, ah, oh my god, okay. I'm sorry, this is really fucking exciting. Okay, cool. So that's all good. That's very good. Good, 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 good. Alright, I think it's time to finally package this up into a proper circuit board. I've seen everything I need to see. Damn, bro, I didn't know you had poison spider alligator clips. That's sick. Really, though? What you doing, dog? What's up, dude? Having yourself a good time, eh? Get you 15 seconds of fame on the tube. Oi! Focus, you cheeky cat. Hey, what's going on, mate? How are you doing? Look at him. Sunbathing. Enjoying life. Seek. Alright, so it's a bit rough, but um, I'm just trying to squeeze this all together into a nice tiny package, and I think we're getting somewhere. So this is starting to look like something. We're going to have a move button and then a, an increase, decrease button, whatever. I'm thinking we're going to have an LED just because I feel like it might keep the, uh, might be a good indicator. I don't know. I'll have to see if I want that or not. On the back sides where all the magic happens. It ain't pretty, but it works. So, so far we have Resistors going to each transistor. Uh, all the transistor uh, grounds are on the inside. They're all going to be connected together. Uh, the resistor at the bottom is for the uh, the temperature sender. So we're just about done. There's only a few actual wires that have to be run. The only thing i got to figure out is how I want to uh, connect this board to the stuff inside the car. I'd like to ideally have it um, easily disconnectable in case I do have to take it out or something. I'd rather not have to hard solder it in case I do have to take it out and upload code or, you know, just whatever. It'd be interesting to use an Ethernet jack. Things to think about, but we're getting somewhere. So once this is all done, I'm just going to cut this section of board out so it's nice and thin. So looking for uh, spots for this to mount. It's a nice big open spot here. I don't remember what the lights are, but 
that out there important. And look what seems to fit in there rather nicely. Hmm. I think we got a winner. All right. The divorce was successful. A little hacksaw and then a Dremel to finish the job. Check it out, huh? Not too shabby. Cleaned up the edges, made them look a little nicer. Everything is nice and compact. Eh? Huh? Eh? Huh? That ain't too bad. Alright, take a gander at that sexy beast, huh? Huh? Hmm? Nice. But she's all together and seems to work rather well. Our first trigger point is at uh, 220, I think, 221. So you notice the green light comes on. Now let's say the temperature goes back down, kicks off around 210 or something like that. And let's keep pushing it. So low, medium, and then high. So it seems rather simple, but it took a couple tries on the code to finally get it to do that the way I wanted it to. Okay, so I think we finally got it. So we have a regular temperature reading here. And then we have all of our adjustments. So the bottom one moves us and the right one adjusts. So there's a couple things going on here. The number you see is the number that triggers it and the stuff on the left is a little code that I came up with so that I know which one I'm at. The uh, problem is since we only have two buttons to work with that really limits us with uh, the inputs that we can do and since I decided that one is going to advance the menu and one is going to change something uh, we have six different units so that means 12 different menus one for up and one for down. So the way that I've coded this is the middle line tells us which fan temperature we're doing. So we have low, medium, and high. And then the stuff on the right and the left tells us what mode we're in. So the stuff on the right is going to be our on temperature, and the stuff on the left is going to be our off temperature. If it's at the top, then we're adding to the number. If it's on the bottom, we're lowering the number. So if that didn't make sense, right now we are on the low fan speed, and we are adding to the on position. So if we push our red button, this number goes up. So then when we hit the next button, now we're still on low and we're still on the on temperature, but now it will decrease the number instead. So now we move on to the next one. So this is the low temperature off number. And it increases here, decreases there. So this is what medium looks like. So you got medium on addition, medium on subtraction, and then you have your medium off, then we have our high on, and our high off. And then it takes you back to that. So there you go. Along with that, our LED comes on with the different colors and stuff like that. So I think it's ready for a case. That is looking pretty sick. I'm excited. Uh, and just to run you real quick, if you want to do a, see how all this works, um, we're using EEPROM to uh, save the numbers so we can remember them later. That's real simple stuff. Uh, and then we just have a gigantic switch case. <coughs> and then at the very end, it's just a simple if statement. So if the menu is greater than 12, it makes it zero. So that brings us back to the beginning. But basically, case 0 is just printing the temperature, and then case 1, so in this one you notice it adds to low, and we print low, and then this right here is the raw uh, way that you write to the, the matrix um, display. So with this library that I'm using, the Adafruit GFX library, you can uh, write whatever you want. So the first number is the digit, you have 0, 1, uh, 3, and 4, 2 is the semicolon, or 2 is the colon, so we don't really care. And then you just put a number from 0 to 255 in there, and it puts out some kind of stuff. And then after that we tell it to write the display, so this tells it what to store into the RAM, and then this actually displays it. 
and then if the number changed we update it with the EEPROM. You don't want to write EEPROM over and over and over again because it does have a limited lifespan and you'll burn it out doing that. So to figure out what all the symbols were, I basically, the I had the number here that I was putting into it and then over here was just what was changing. So each one that you see here is uh, the different symbol. So if you tell it to write 4, the thing on the left is going to be what 4 outputs. So you can see every single thing that goes on. So by doing that I can just pick out what, uh, what symbol I want to display. So once this gets to 128, then it rolls over and it follows the same exact pattern but with the decimal point. So you can do this with or without the decimal point. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So there you go. There's a fan controller. I think we're there. Sorry for talking your head off, but even simple projects like this take a lot of effort. Okay, so we're going to put this guy right in there. So that's the plan of attack. I'm thinking I want it angled to follow this um, angle right here because putting it straight might look a little goofy and I need it to stick out in the back anyway for the ethernet jack which by the way I think I'm gonna do I bought this a long time ago when I was trying to figure out what I could use for connectors for the uh, the jacks and this was a thought but they're too expensive and they're really big and awkward and they're open in the back and just all kinds of just meh but the cool thing is that should fit nicely in the back there so I'll make a little slide for this to interface I guess with the case or something or I don't know I'll figure something out so that'll go in there and uh, then we should be okay and then we, we got the wires right here we can just run to whatever we need and then we'll just snip the cable and run them to everything else I'm liking where this is going okay so <laughs> again it ain't the prettiest but I think that should do it so that actually fits in there rather nicely we got all our lines so we got our three fan outputs for the coil ground that blue one over there is the AC input. We have positive power, we have ground, and we have 12 volt in to the VIN pin. So that should be everything, and we still got a spare wire. So if I ever need to add one more thing. Oh, shit. That one more thing is for the temperature. Jesus Christ. <laughs> We're not even, okay, so that, yep. Yeah, see, this is why we go over things. Okay, wow, so all eight pins are being used. Well, I'm going to run that brown one down to there, and then we'll be good. Okay, so we've got a few more features here, so now i got another menu option. So now we have manual control over what happens. So we have auto, off, in case you want to turn it off, or like water fording or something weird like that. Um, we have low, we have medium, and we have high. And you notice the LED also changes. So in auto mode, it runs through all the auto code, and all these other ones bypass all that code and just control it directly. Now the only characters I really couldn't figure out how to do well was the W and the M. This is the best solution I could figure out for making a W, and that's the best for making an M. It looks like crap, but I, I couldn't. <laughs> that's about the best I could do. So well, but it's functional. And on top of that, I added one more feature because now that there's like 13 different menus, it takes fucking forever to get home. So now if we hold both buttons, we go home. Now the way that I have it set up, in order to keep the red button from adjusting our value, I have it read the black pin. So if the black pin is not being pushed, then the red one works. So the trick is to push the black first, and then the red, and then it'll bring you home. Because if you push the red and then the black, you could accidentally adjust a, a, a feature. So, for instance, if we go red and then black, it still takes you home, but now this reading's all messed up. So, yeah. Black and then red, and you're good to go. Cool. I think she's ready. That's, that's about everything I could think of. This is <laughs> freaking feature-packed. I'm digging it. So... The case is a little big, and that's mostly because of the Ethernet jack, but I'm curious what this uh, turns out like, so we'll see in a bit. We're at 90%. We're almost there. Alright, take a gander. 
So, it's far from perfect, but it'll do. Especially considering how often I didn't actually... I, I only made a, a few little test things. I didn't really try. The, the most advanced I got was printing out a thin little sheet just to make sure that everything lined up. That was extremely important to make sure that when you put it down, everything lines up properly. But besides that, yeah, we just kind of gave it our best. It fit. <laughs> it took a little bit of uh, sanding to get it all to fit in there the way that I wanted it to. It'll do. Okay, so here it is out in the daylight. A little thick, but that's mostly because of the, uh, the jack. You don't know jack, kid. Who's jack? So, I designed, I designed it to fit in there, and it fits rather well. It could have been just a hair smaller, so that it would fit in there a little better. But I wanted it to sit at an angle anyway. So... That's okay, I guess. I think we can make it work. Things getting to be a little bit of a pain in the bugger. We're gonna send her in up there. And we got a little electrical tape to help feed her through. All right, so apparently that one's really hard to use. I had to wrap this thing tight and really pull that fucker to get it through, but she's finally through. The trick is to make this wrap really tight and make sure that it's got a good cone on there so it really slides through easy. Okay, so I've got everything marked out here. We've got all our wire colors, orange, orange, white, brown, blue, green, you get the deal. So we have everything, what they go to. We got our AC, 12 volt, our temperature sender, fan one, fan two, fan three, ground, and our five volt for the temp sender as well. So now we take this mess of wires and plug it into that mess of wires and we should be golden. I figure we'll have the temp sender wires run back this way on the engine and then everything else is just located all in this little area right here. Sweet. So we got everything hooked up according to the diagram. So if this works properly, when we turn on the ignition, we should get power. Oh, oh hey, we have power. It reads 82. It reads 82, which looks about right. So, let's try the uh, the manual mode. Right now we're in auto. Go to off. Okay, let's go to low. Hey, we have a fan on. Let's go to medium. Oh, we have the other fan on. Let's go to high. Oh, baby. Yes. Oh, it works. It works a charm. That is sweet. Oh, yeah, buddy. Holy. And the temperature looks spot on too. It says 82, and right now it says it's 91 outside, and it says 83. Oh, look at that. Look at how close it is. It says 83 on the REM. Holy shit, dude. I am getting good at this. Oh, man, so it all works. Oh, that's incredible. Well, shit, okay. I guess we'll uh, do it up proper, start it all together, and call it a day. Holy shit. Uh, it's nice when stuff just works, man. That's awesome. That is awesome. Nice. That transistor input's a little sensitive too. It actually triggers by my finger, but it, it's it's it keeps raising up and down. But Jesus Christ, really? That's incredible. <laughs> huh. Okay. So the final step that I'm gonna do is add something called a flyback diode for the relay coils. The, the coil inside these uh, relays are an inductor, so what that means, I guess, is that it takes a little bit of time for them to charge up, kind of like a capacitor. And what happens is when you turn that off, all that energy's got to go somewhere. So uh, it usually creates a large voltage spike, and that could hurt sensitive electronics like transistors, and eventually over time it'll spark over switches and stuff like that and burn out the contacts. So what this diode does, is uh, provide a reverse path for the coil to discharge itself. So what we're doing is hooking up these diodes backwards from normal. If you notice the cathode, or the thing with the line on it, is going to go straight to our ignition positive. Actually this is going to be just battery positive since our coils are also hooked up to battery positive. And then the other end, the anode of the diodes, that is the positive side, 
is going to go to the negative of our coils. So all these lines, each one of them are going to get their own diode. So that way when the coil shuts off, the power goes through the diodes instead of our transistors and, you know, might help things out. For big electronics like switches and crap like that, you don't really need to do this, but it's nice just to have. So these are rated up to a thousand volts. I think they should be good for what we need. It's a, a 1N4000 or something like that. I don't know. It's a plain Jane diode for the most part. All right, so I'm, I'm sure there's a better solution, but if you ever find yourself where uh, your solder is not sticking to the other part that you want, no matter how hot you get it, you can use something called flux. Now there's a couple different kinds of flux. I don't know if this is meant for soldering or not. This is general purpose soldering flux, so I think it's good for soldering. But I don't know if it's for electrical or for pipe stuff. But anyway, it's just a paste, and what you do is you smear it on there, onto the surface that you can't get to solder, and you heat it up real good. And when it gets all hot and bubbly, it's like an acid and it cleans up the surface real nice, and then the solder should flow real good. So, now that that's all good, we can uh, properly cover that and then run our three uh, leads to the other leads and uh, we're good. Okay, that should do it. So each uh, coil has its own little orange wire that runs off to the, uh, the relay. So I think we can clean this all up with some wire looms. Call it a day. Alright, so there we go. It's all cleaned up. So we have our temperature sender line over here. And all that runs underneath this goodness. Comes out over here. So we have our ethernet cord. And that goes into a loom right here. And that comes out to all this stuff. So all this is loomed up. So we got some of our wires over here. And then they go down to there and over here. And it all looks rather nice. Not too shabby if I don't say so myself. Okay, so if everything works, then uh, all this should be a go. So we've got a manual mode. So we can come in here right now and set to auto. We can tell it off for water crossing or whatever. We have low. So you notice our low fan comes on. And we get a little green light. And we can go to medium, which is like a yellow. And that turns on our other fan instead. And then high, light goes red, and both fans come on full blast. Nice. All right, so now we're running. So our final test is going to be the air conditioner. So we slide this to max. Let's keep an eye over here. Squeaky. So, you see the light is blue right now, and the little O over there to the left, that's just for, so you know EC is on. It's not a little funny, so then we turn it off, and it shuts off. Cool. Yeah, look at the temperatures going up already. It already reads 91, 92. REM reads about 89. Nice. So I'm gonna let this run for a little bit and just see how it goes. I could not make this up if I tried. So check this out. Infrared dot. 132, right? 133, 135. They're like spot on. So I guess I got that temperature t reading down perfectly. Look at that, 135, 135. Holy crap. That's incredible. <laughs> that is literally spot on to the thermostat. Holy shit. Cool. I'm impressed. This little guy's awesome. Alright. It's been tracking pretty good so far. We're at 206 on here, 204, 206, 204 right now. So, not feeling too bad. Seems like it's slightly low. That reads about 207, 208, depending on where I point it. 206. It's, you know, it's, it's pretty close. It's within, you know, 2 or 3 degrees, which ain't too bad. So I could fine tune it a little bit for my sensor. But she's doing alright. I also want to average that number. Because I don't know if you just saw that, but it jumped up to like 230 for a second, and it went high and then went low instantly. So uh, I'm going to try and average that out so it doesn't jump around. So now it says it's up to 224. It froze for a second. I don't know what happened. It stopped at 208. So this reads about 218. Yeah, it's not bad. Alright, so now it's just on medium mode. 
but it does seem to work, but the temperature does fluctuate a lot. So I'm gonna average the crap out of it, but it does seem like it functions. So now we're just on low mode, cool. I dig it. That's pretty neat. That does seem to actually work. Oh yeah, that's cool. I dig it. All right, good enough for me. Let's get the Velcro and finish this job. All right, so it's been a little while since uh, I've been last messing with this, but here is what we finally got going on. So you will notice there's a few additions here. Uh, we have a, a light sensor at the top so that we can actually dim the display. So at night it's dimmer and so is the LED so that way you're not getting blinded at night. And second off is a bypass switch. So this is a safety override in case this thing ever fails. Uh, there is manual control over your fan because if this thing ever craps out for any reason, anything goes wrong, we miss anything, this is extremely important, especially for my setup. I only have electric fans, so if this shuts the bed, I'm toast. So now we got a backup fan. So in case you're ever screwed, you can count on the switch. Um, okay, so I've averaged the, uh, the temperature readout, and now it's awesome. It works really well. So I just got like a, a crazy amount of averaging on there. So the temperature's stable, and it's it's cool to see what the thermostat does because all the temperatures are different. You know, between the thing on the gauge, the thermostat, and the REM, which is reading from the block, you can kind of get around about how the entire engine cooling system is working. So it's it's cool to have an eye on everything like that. So that's really neat. Um, so there's one last problem that I'm battling, and that is that the this guy freezes up like almost constantly during the daytime. Uh, so it'll work good for a little while, and then as you're starting to drive, it you uh, the display has a persistence in there, so if it doesn't receive any new commands, it just displays the old stuff. So it's hard to tell when this is frozen. The only way that you can know is that you'll notice that the temperature gauge up here is starting to rise. And you're like, oh, that's not good. Unplug it, plug it back in, temperature jumps up like 20, you're like, oh, oh, oh you were frozen, okay. So. I'm using a Pro Trink in here to do all the business. Well, that thing only has a voltage regulator that's good up to 150 milliamps. That's nothing. So I got a feeling that uh, it's also good up to 16 volts, but it's converting, you know, like 14 volts down to 5 volts, and that creates a lot of heat. So I'm thinking that the itty bitty little regulator on there is uh, starting to overheat um, so that it, it's not working very well. So I'm going to put an external regulator in here, and hopefully that would prevent it from freezing. Because during the night, it works perfectly fine. Literally, I can run it the entire night, and it's okay. So there's two things. One, the display is dimmer, so it's using less power. And two, it's also cooler at, because there's no direct sun beating down on it. So I'm, it's got to be a heat issue. That's the only thing I can think of. So yeah, external regulator, um, backup switch, dimming, all that good stuff. So, now on to the fun stuff. I'm sure a lot of people are asking, am I going to build them and sell them? I want to say yes, as long as I can get them to work. Right now I've got some rear axle issues to deal with, so I can't really drive the Jeep. But, uh, plans are going to be to add a alphanumeric LED display, so that way we can do text as well, and that'll be cool, and you can choose whatever color you want. There's like five or six different colors. You can have red and blue and white and yellow and green and yellow green and all that crap. So, yeah, you can choose what kind of color you want um, and stuff like that. It'll be able to do three uh, fans. You'll have your uh, LED. I'd like to add a third button on here, so that way you can have your... Uh, like your next button and up and down so that way we can cut our menus down in half so that way instead of doing like 13 We're only doing you know seven So yeah three buttons and uh, I definitely still want an override switch for you guys because I don't want to sell something and have it Mess up and then your engine blow up. So we're gonna have some kind of override switch as well very important and real quick Another thing to think about is uh, if I do sell these, what am I going to do for the temperature sender? Because obviously I'm using a thermostat housing. So unless you want to buy yourself a thermostat housing with that sensor in there and switch to that, then hey, that works great. But otherwise, uh, I'm a little lost on how to do that because this needs some kind of temperature stuff. Uh, I am thinking about maybe building it into an REM, so that could take care of two birds with one stone if you want. So we could do that. 
but if you just want a standalone controller I need to figure out what to do for the temperature so if you want to use if you have the extra thermostat sensor and you want to use that then this will work perfectly it'll you know it'll work fine but if you want to use something else I don't know how I'm gonna do that because obviously it takes a lot of math to get that sensor right so yeah let me know what you'd want to do for the temperature stuff unless I do like a probe that you can just stick on the radiator or something I don't know that's that's the really tough part so if we can figure that out we'll be good uh, besides that I think that's pretty much it but I have other things to do so once I get the REM uh, stuff in check I get the next versions version 4 we're gonna talk about that soon once I get that going then I might start work on this I got a lot on the table and a lot to do but that's all for now so thanks for hanging on hopefully I didn't burn you out I know this video is long but it was a long process for this thing you know it looks simple but there's a lot going on okay that's all for now thanks for watching